why don't we talk about kind of some general topics that have to do with the MR of the bone. Uh, let me just... Okay. So uh, you're all familiar with the epiphysis and, uh, and, and the end of the bones, but a lot of things happen here. Uh, and here's really the, the growth cartilage in through here. Here are the end arterioles that we've talked a lot about where cancer and uh, infection tend to lodge. Uh, <clears throat> and then you've got the vessels going into uh, all of these areas. So we'll, we'll talk about some of the, 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 the way in which the bones put together, which gives some of the signal changes that we see. So physiologically, in the long bone, all you have is the bulk of the force, as we talked about in the knee, is really in the cortical bone, with the central area here being more uh, trabecular cancellous type bone. And there's very little of that in the mid diaphysis. And as we discussed, as you get more toward the metaphyses, you start getting more and more trabecular bone here. Uh, so you shift the, 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 weight of the, cort the weight of the body from the cortical bone into the trabecular bone, which then distributes it evenly across the joint space, at least around the knee where you have weight-bearing areas. If you look carefully at the cortical bone, you can see there's Haversian canals uh, here, which you all know uh, is continuously remodeling because you get microfractures of the uh, hard part of the bone. And if you don't remodel it, those will coalesce and produce macro fractures, and you'll get uh, insufficiency fractures of the bone. So the remodeling uh, through these Haversian canals uh, is important to maintain normal integrity of the bone over time. That's one of the reasons why artificial structures, even metals, uh, have a tendency to break over time <clears throat> because they can't remodel themselves and correct those micro fractures which, which developed. And here's just some examples of the kind of fractures you can get uh, and that, that have to be continuously repaired over the lifetime of the individual. <clears throat> and here's just kind of a 3D rendering of what those Haversian canals uh, really look like uh, over time. And so we can see a lot of, a lot of normal bone physiology. And here's just some uh, micrographs here showing what the, the structure of the cortical bone kind of looks like. And there's some... Uh, cells that keep remodeling it. And here's just an example of, a, of an osteocyte inside the bone. So that's this normal remodeling. How bone is remodeled. Now, this scene illustrates the imbalances in the remodeling process in a patient with osteoporosis. So let's talk about osteoporosis. This postmenopausal woman has severe osteoporosis. With Can everybody hear this? this scene? Uh, can you, can you can't really hear this? Were you able to hear the video? Not very well. Uh, the sound is a little. Okay, let, let, let me see if I but can. He, uh, as I remember, he, his voice is a little squeaky. Okay, well, let's, let's try that again. Okay. This scene depicts how bone is remodeled in the spine of a healthy premenopausal woman. The vertebral body is composed of the two main types of bone, an outer shell of dense cortical bone surrounding trabecular bone, which, as we zoom in, we see is comprised of a honeycomb-like network of trabecular plates and bars. To initiate a new remodeling cycle, Mononucleated osteoclast precursor cells leave the peripheral circulation for sites on the bone surface. Once there, these cells fuse to form multinucleated osteoclasts. The osteoclasts remove the old bone matrix, creating a resorption cavity. This process takes about one and a half months. The osteoclasts are followed by a team of osteoblasts that refill the resorption cavity. This takes about five months, or more than three times the duration of the resorption phase. At the end of the cycle, the resorption cavity is refilled and a new packet of bone has been formed. As we leave the scene, we see several sites undergoing active remodeling. By continuously replacing old bone with new bone, 
The normal remodeling cycle maintains the mechanical strength of trabecular and cortical bone. Okay, so, the, so that's the way it works on the trabecular bone. And what happens when people develop osteoporosis is that the new bone formation is less than the old bone was, so you get over time uh, loss of, of bone. And that typically occurs when you, for people who are not physically active, because what determines whether you replace the the uh, uh, resorb bone with, how, with new bone and, and more of it has to do with the stress pattern on the bone. So if you have more stresses, then the osteoblasts are more active and produce more bone, whereas if you have less stresses, then they produce less bone. Uh, so one of the key factors in developing a loss of the normal strength of the bone and density of the bone is, is lack of stress and lack of exercise. That's one of the reasons why exercise is really important, especially in females and especially in older individuals. Uh, uh, calcium. This scene. What, John? Calcium. I recommend Tums for mainly women four times a day to prevent it. Yeah, the, the, the problem with, with calcium and and, uh, and vitamin D is that... Um, 2,000 international units. Yeah, but more recent studies have shown that if you give vitamin D and calcium, you get an increased risk for renal stones, but it doesn't tend to affect the progression of osteoporosis very much. So you have to be a little careful. Uh, every medication has some drawbacks, doesn't it? Yeah, it's true. Yeah. So, uh, so, and this scene, so this scene one of the illustrates how anti-resorptive agents act to reduce resorptive activity and thereby prevent further deterioration in bone structure. Again, to consider the case of a postmenopausal woman who has severe osteoporosis with a lumbar spine T-score of minus three several vertebral compression fractures, and back pain. In the vertebral body, the cortical bone is thinner than normal, and there is clear deterioration in the structure of trabecular bone. The trabeculae are reduced in number and thickness, and several are perforated. With the administration of an anti-resorptive agent, the number of osteoclasts formed is reduced. Fewer precursor cells fuse to form fewer osteoclasts. The reduced numbers of osteoclasts dig shallower resorption cavities. Bone formation follows resorption, and at the end of formation, the cavity is almost completely filled. The number of active remodeling units is reduced to normal. Consequently, there are fewer mechanical stress risers on the surface of the trabeculae, and trabecular perforation is reduced. Also as a consequence of the reduced turnover rate, trabecular mineralization is increased. The degree to which turnover decreases and consequently mineralization increases varies among different anti-resorptive agents. The relationship between mineralization and bone strength is not yet well characterized. Anti-resorptive agents also maintain the structure of cortical bone. So one of the problem with anti-resorptive agents, though they, they are used a lot uh, these days, is that by decreasing the uh, amount of turnover, uh, it allows these microfractures to coalesce. So some of these, even though they produce increased density in the bone, uh, there are some characteristics, uh, insufficiency fractures uh, that occur, probably because uh, when you use these agents, uh, you have more of a tendency to develop the coalescence of microfractures into macrofractures. So uh, it's not clear-cut always 
how these agents should be appropriately used. Okay, uh, let's see. Michael, what do you think of this case? The 62-year-old female left femoral pain with limping for one year. Pain and tenderness at both femoral shafts. Um, bisphosphonate. Okay, so we see that uh, signal abnormality along the lateral aspect of the subtrochanteric bone, and that's a classic location for bisphosphonate-associated stress fractures. And we see it's hot on the bone scan or radi increased radio tracer uptake. Well, the whole the fracture where you, you where you have the loss of the normal uh, uh, signal intensity you get due to the dephasing from compressed trabecular there and some increased signal intensity in the cortical bone uh, adjacent to it. And this is what it looks like on uh, plain radiographs. So that's the classic biphosphonate associated fracture. And here is a completed fracture in that same area. So. Now, so that's the biphosphonates. Now, there are uh, another uh, group of agents called the male and female rats. Teraparentine caused an increase in the incidence of osteosarcoma, a malignant bone tumor that was dependent on dose and treatment duration. The effect was observed at systemic exposures to teraparotide, ranging from 3 to 60 times the exposure in humans given a 20 microgram dose. Because of the uncertain relevance of the rat osteosarcoma finding to humans, teraparotide should be prescribed only to patients for whom the potential benefits are considered to outweigh the potential risk. Teraparotide should not be prescribed for patients who are at an increased baseline risk for osteosarcoma, including those with Paget's disease of bone, or unexplained elevations of alkaline phosphatase, open epiphyses, or prior external beam or implant radiation therapy involving the skeleton. See warnings and precautions, carcinogenesis. Forteo, teraparotide rDNA origin injection is indicated for the treatment of postmenopausal women with osteoporosis who are at a high risk for fracture. These include women with a history of osteoporotic fracture or who have multiple risk factors for fracture or who have failed or are intolerant of previous osteoporosis therapy based upon physician assessment, see black box warning. In postmenopausal women with osteoporosis, Forteo increases BMD and reduces the risk of vertebral and nonvertebral fractures. Forteo, teraparotide or DNA origin injection, is indicated to increase bone mass in men with primary or hypogonadal osteoporosis who are at high risk for fracture. These include men with a history of osteoporotic fracture or who have multiple risk factors for fracture or who have failed or are intolerant to previous osteoporosis therapy based upon physician assessment, see black box warning. In men with primary or hypogonadal osteoporosis, Forteo increases BMD. The effects of Forteo on risk for fracture in men have not been studied. Teraparotide is the first bone formation agent for the treatment of osteoporosis. While anti-resorptive agents reduce both resorption and formation, teraparotide increases formation. Again, we consider the case of a postmenopausal woman who has severe osteoporosis with a lumbar spine T-score of minus 3, several vertebral compression fractures, and back pain. In the vertebral body, the cortical bone is thinner than normal, and there is clear deterioration in the structure of trabecular bone. The trabeculae are reduced in number and thickness, and several are perforated. The initial action of teraparotide is to stimulate bone formation directly by activation of osteoblasts. In other words, teraparotide initiates bone formation without prior resorption. New bone is formed on trabecular surfaces. Traditional bone remodeling then begins. 
the bone remodeling rate is increased with a positive balance in each remodeling unit. Teraparatide stimulates increased osteoblast activity. When bone formation is completed, more bone is formed than was removed. Teraparatide's anabolic action increases skeletal mass and bone strength. As we leave the scene, we see the increased number of active remodeling sites. In each site, bone formation exceeds bone resorption. Furthermore, teraparatide also acts on cortical bone surfaces to form new bone. Please continue viewing to see black box warning and safety information for teraparatide. Okay. Ashu, what do you think of this case? Um, looks like there is a defect of the cortical margin along the medial aspect of the tibia there. Uh, oh, okay, so it looks like it's um, continuous with the medullary canal. Um, and, oh, uh-oh, there looks like there's some soft tissue growing in there. Um, uh, I don't know, this is a difficult to see. I think this is CT showing some some increased signals in the medullary canal of this of this tibia. So what do you think this um, is? Huh? What, what do you think this might be? It could be an osteosarc. Mm. Um, so so we see a big defect here in the cortical bone. Right. And then, but uh, it's uh, kind of smooth margins, and we. Uh, you know, I, I don't really see a big mass here. We can see some density here with uh, uh, replacing some of the fat around it. Uh, this turns out to be a varix. Oh, okay. A varix in, in the bone. Uh, it really doesn't have that uh, irregular destructive appearance that you would typically see with an osteosarcoma. And the margins are really pretty small. I mean, really sharply defined here. Uh, but anyway, so... That, that was just a uh, cortical varics. Uh, Jennifer, what do you think of this case? All right, so we have an 11-year-old with pain for three months. Um, yeah, I don't see any definite fracture plane here. There's that lucency there along the tibia but it's bilateral so I'm thinking well this could be some uh, Salter Harris 2 fracture um, it looks like there is some lucency extending through the cortex but it is bilateral and it goes through the physis yeah. it could also be a stress reaction it's happening with that physis um, there's some edema around the physis and it looks like it's, I don't really see, it's a little wider than the remaining physis. I'm thinking some kind of stress reaction. So, and then 13 months later, it looks like most of that edema has resolved. Yeah, well, here is an issue. This is actually a different patient with the same thing. Oh. And we can see these little things in here. So th these are called focal periphyseal edema areas zones. And it's, it's commonly seen in adolescents. And it probably has something to do with the initiation stages of fecial closure. Uh, but, but these are, are, are basically normal and shouldn't be misinterpreted as, uh, as pathology.
focal per perifacial edema. Uh, it's, you don't. Is it no? I have a question. Is it normal to see that lucency though around the physis on the case before this? That there is that normal. What lucency are you talking about? Kind of along the proximal tibial diaphysis, but it's bilateral. It looks like there's some lucency extending to the physis. It depends on the strength of the uh, X-ray. Um, yeah, the, are you talking about this? Yes, I was concerned about that. And it's, I think we just we're just viewing one side here. So uh, I, you know, I, I, the primary thing here is that these little focal areas of edema uh, here in the in the physis. Uh, I'm not sure what this is. It's, but it's it's not a not a fracture. That uh, and then here we can these things can kind of come and go, and they tend to be uh, right around the time of the initiation closure of the. Uh, that's tubercle area, isn't it? The well, the, we're kind of in the middle of the of the of the joint, a little anterior to the middle part of the joint here, so and that's in the. Femur. So anyway, the, the, these have been described in their reports in the literature, uh, and the, these are just uh, normal physiology for these kids. Okay, Michael. Okay, so five-year-old female, right knee pain, mental retardation, developmental delay, congenital insensitivity to pain. Oh, okay, so. It looks like we're just, you know, this looks like a chronic fracture of the physeal plate. Like it's dislocated. There's a lot of surrounding soft tissue edema, swelling, like marked. And then there's also bony changes that you can see. So it's definitely chronic. And if it's due to pain and de developmental delay, just probably not feeling it. This is like just a yeah, big chronic Salter Harris fracture. Seeing it is huge uh, peristaltic reaction changes simply because they they don't feel it so they don't protect themselves. Exuberant callus. Okay. And so this is a patient here. We can see uh, this is an older individual. Extensive amount of fat within the marrow space here. We don't really see any hematopoietic marrow at all, maybe a little old infarct up here. And we can see very little trabecular bone here, and that's severe osteoporosis on MR. Uh, T1 weighted image, really, it's uh, very little trabecular bone. It's just all fat replacement here. Uh, could that be an osteomalase exchange, John, or what's the difference? Uh, well, osteomalacia would be kind of abnormal bone, and there I would expect uh, more cellular elements in it. Whereas if it's just osteoporosis, where you just have loss of the of the mineralization of the bone, that I would expect it to look like this. Yeah, the, and this one looks like ready for a fracture. Yeah, I agree. Okay, uh, Ashu, what do you think of this case? Sorry, I keep on disconnecting. Um, looking at this, uh, looks like there's a bone on bone appearance of the bone vertebra. Hello? Hello? Hello, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. I keep on disconnecting. Okay. Um, and so you, you're thinking about like Paget's disease. Um, uh, that doesn't look like Paget's, I don't think. Uh, no, the iliac bones look okay. Um, let's see here. Um, let's see here. You can also, I mean, it's it's a pretty wide differential. Um, you just have a sickle cell disease. You can have chronic osteomyelitis. Um, yeah. This is adult osteopetrosis. 
Petrosis, okay. Uh, one of the common findings of this is the Erlenmeyer flask, uh, deformity of the, of the long bones, especially the distal uh, uh, femur. And uh, it's autosomal dominant. You can get increased bone density, but uh, the characteristic finding here is this bone within a bone appearance and osteopetrosis. And it's a, congen it's a congenital variation. Uh, Okay, uh, Jennifer, what do you think of this case? Um, so there's a clip overlying the superior mediastinum. So I would be thinking this is a PDA closure device. Um, and sometimes they give endomethacin as well. Um, okay, so here we have some fraying and cupping of the metaphyseal regions um, and again here some fraying of the metaphyseal regions so what kind of things would you be thinking about here can you uh, rickets or um, okay. uh, there's some kind of vitamin deficiency that can cause this Vitamin D, <laughs> but uh, uh, rickets has a, an appearance in the legs that are more most prominent. Boeing. Uh, this was rickets. Very good. Excellent. Yeah, it's it, it's. Fortunately, we don't see that very often, do we? I've never seen a case. Uh, I have, but not too many. Yeah, it starts as classic metaphyseal lesion. So the big thing is rickets versus child abuse or other trauma. But this this kind of flaring here of the metaphysis is pretty characteristic of, of rickets. Okay. okay, child in ER with history of fall two weeks ago, presenting with irritability and crying. So we have all this kind of sheet-like uh, calcitic or osseous formation kind of surrounding the femur. Um, so things I'm thinking of, like this could be you know, some weird type of myositis ossificans. There's also, yeah, like you're pointing out, there's a fracture and separation of the distal femur epiphysis. Um, so I don't know if this is either recurrent trauma, because they shouldn't have that so much with the fall. Well, this is oh, so periosteal hematoma. hematoma. Okay. So calcified hematoma? Okay, I see. Scurvy, which makes them at risk for assault or Harris one fractures. Yeah, uh, yeah that's just uh, right. Uh, Ashu, what do you think of this case? Um, so this patient has a history of fibrous dysplasia. Um, just looking here. Is there some irregularity of the, oh, is the apophysis? No, that's that's normal. Um, is there some irregularity of that left uh, left iliac wing there? Right there, yeah, is there a lytic lesion there? Okay. Uh, it looks like, uh, oh, it's right there, yeah. Uh, looks actually fairly well demarcated, uh, fluid filled, doesn't seem to influence the, the cortical bone there. Um, it's mild. It's mildly expansile. Pretty sharp margins here on the on the X-ray, as well as here, and mm -hmm. this turned out to be an old subperiosteal hematoma. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, Jennifer. A 31-year-old female with a myelomeningocele, hydrocephalus, paraplegia, and chronic hip osteomyelitis, pyelonephritis, progressive weakness, and swelling in the lower limbs. Do you want to go to pediatrics? Um, 31 years old. So she has multiple anomalies. Um, wow, okay. Um, there's diffuse cortical expansion and irregularity in the pelvis, and this is a congenital syndrome. Um, gosh, it's, it's like Mafuchis or Oliers, um, McCune Albright. Multiple fractures. Um, oh, um, what is this called? Osteogenesis imperfecta, but that doesn't look like it. Yeah, I, I, this may be, I'm, normal slowly or less, yeah, I would, I, now you would see fractures in the legs if that was osteogenesis. Uh, that's not osteogenesis. Uh, it's a different case, but it's the same diagnosis. Uh, so, with uh, all this periosteal reaction and so forth, there are, there are there are a lot of there's a pretty big difference. Is that is some hematologic disorder? And then here's his brother, and this is uh, pachydermal periostitis. So, just, you know, but basically, it looks like a congenital syndrome, and so you'd have to then go through it. And the, the problem now is, uh, you know, when I was in medical school, there were only a few congenital syndromes. Now uh, there are there are probably thousands, maybe even more, many more than that, because uh, uh, now that you can you determine them not so much by their clinical presentation, but by their genetic <laughs> makeup. Uh, so. I ran three clinics at the orthopedic hospital um, yeah. years ago, and um, we used to bring kids from Mexico um, to treat them for free. Now, of course, we don't uh, close the border, but um, and, and um, orthopedic hospital now is uh, in Santa Monica, right? Uh, part of uh, part of uh, USC. Uh, but I, I, I didn't see all these uh, syndromes. Um, they never made it to my clinic, I guess. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I did my, I, I saw cases, but uh, they used to choose them um, to be able to treat them and, and take care of them. Uh, they wouldn't pick anybody that they we couldn't treat. They went to pediatrics. Right. Good. So I'm going to talk a little bit about acute injuries here. And a lot of this lecture comes from back in the early days when uh, it wasn't clear some of the things that we were seeing on on MR. And we, we divided uh, signal changes into basically three different types. Uh, uh, one was a, a type 1. The cortex was in type, but we saw edema within the subcondral bone, typically in the metaphysis. T1-weighted coronal image of the, of the knee. Uh, and I said we published a study where uh, we, we basically had 33 what turned out to be trabecular bone injuries, only one of which was positive on x-ray. Uh, uh, many of these patients went to arthroscopy, and some other people in Canada published uh, kind of similar results. Uh, the bottom line is uh, these are trabecular bone injuries, which were not really described well. Uh, before MR era because you really couldn't diagnose them uh, by other techniques. They'd be positive on a bone scan, most of them, except in the very acute stages. Uh, but uh, with MR, we could really characterize these much better. And it turned about about half of people who came in with acute knee injuries uh, and had knee pain uh, 
uh, uh, had this as their only finding. So we think that these are commonly associated with acute, acute knee pain. Uh, type 2 is where the cortex was broken. Uh, we could have it with or without displacement. Typical example, play, a normal plane radiograph. And here we can see a, a, a fracture through the subchondral bone here and the bone marrow edema here in the bone in the slippers. And you can see a lot of examples of these. So uh, all right. uh, MR is clearly more sensitive than in any of the other techniques we have for, de for de uh, detecting these uh, trabecular stress injuries. If the subchondral bone and cortical bone are intact, then the, these obviously are treated uh, conservatively. If they're in the immediate subchondral bone, uh, they're at risk for developing uh, impaction fractures if they continue to weight bear. But if they're here farther out into the metaphysis, uh, there's not much you can do. They, these are going to heal on their own. But the important thing is that they are, that they are uh, a primary cause of pain. And in those days, what would often be the case is we'd also see meniscal tears, often degenerative meniscal tears. So it was assumed that the meniscal tear was the cause of the pain. The patients would get arthroscopy, and then over about the course of that they'd get over the arthroscopic surgery, their pain would go away, and so everybody was happy. More recently, as what we found out is degenerative tears of the menisci tend not to be a cause of pain, that if they have these with trabecular bone injuries, it's much more likely that the trabecular bone injury is the cause of pain. And we now know that if you do partial meniscectomies in people with, as we talked about in the knee section, with degenerative tears of the menisci, uh, they will progress to more rapid degenerative disease than if you don't operate on them. So it's important to recognize that these trabecular bone injuries are a common uh, source of, of knee pain. Uh, and we can see these in a lot of different areas. This was actually a, a worker here. At, at What's interesting, John, is if you uh, – we used to treat um, a lot of fractures and traction in, in the old days. Yeah. And uh, we used to drive a, a K wire through the tibia or femur distally yeah. and tibia proximally. Um, and we anesthetized only the skin uh, for the periosteum. Uh, there was no pain um, when the K wire went through the um, uh, cancellous bone. Yeah. So, so it's interesting that it's a, a, the expansion of the bone uh, due to um, bleeding, and um, I think it's due to bleeding and um, uh, pressure. Right. Uh, is what causes the pain. Interesting. So that the, the, there is no pain from from uh, tactile stimulation, i.e., a K wire. Interesting. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah, we used to drive uh, anesthetize one side, uh, the periosteum, and then the other side, of course, uh, to make sure that we didn't uh, hurt the patient um, pain wise so when we exited uh, the other side for the K wire. Thank you. That's uh, so that, that's a um, kind of interesting uh, situation in, in, in bone. Yep. Thank you, John. Uh, and I think that applies also to avascular necrosis, i.e. the hip. Um, and there's a lot of pain due to the pressure from the swelling. Interesting. Interesting. So here was a worker who uh, developed a medial collateral ligament tear acutely, and we can see over here a trabecular injury uh, near the origin of the uh, lateral collateral ligament. Um, this was on 2 13, 13. And on the axial images, we can see next to this trabecular bone injury on the lateral femoral condyle, we can see a little subchondral line here, which is a little subchondral uh, trabecular fracture in this patient as well. Uh, uh, if we go uh, uh, here, also sagittal images on 2.13.13, where we can see this subchondral fracture, probably from a traction type injury uh, based upon uh, what he described the mechanism to be. Uh, over, he was treated uh, conservatively, and uh, a few months later, we repeat the MR scan, and you can see that uh, basically everything is healed, even the medial collateral ligament tear. Uh, 
and this location. So one of the reasons I put this in here was that uh, we talked already about having far posterior zone bone and cartilage injuries. And at this, we couldn't figure out the mechanism at that particular time, and we thought this might be a mechanism. But now I think much more likely the mechanism are uh, the impaction injuries that you get in flexion uh, in sports activities where you have tremendous forces over the. Impaction produces, we learned this a long, long time ago, as I remember, John, uh, that impaction produced a lot more edema than, than avulsion. Right. Avulsion didn't produce any edema at all. Right. And right. so I, I, I remember. I said, my God, you know, here's a fracture and there's no edema. There must be a novulsion. Uh, that go, goes back over 20 years. Right. That's right. Yep. Close to 30. Ashu, what do you think of this case? This looks like an incomplete fracture through the distal femur. Um, um, it's going through the posterior wall, treated with rest. With increasing thiphate. So um, it looks like there's some moderate bone marrow edema, and there's a disc. I don't know if there's discontinuity of that posterior cortex and some periosteal reaction as well posteriorly. Yeah. Um, you can see a little bit of a flaring there of the periosteum. So this was a teenager who was supposedly on rest, but it turned out after this happened and they got increasing pain, they finally confessed that they were out uh, playing sports anyway when they weren't supposed to be. And this was just a uh, uh, this actually was a worsening stress fracture due to non-compliance on the part of the patient. So that's a that's an incomplete fracture. Kids in, kids in this age, um, I learned to treat um, vigorously and not trust them uh, just on crutches and or a splint. Uh, I used to put them in a cast so they couldn't um, play games. Okay. But uh, I did have some that uh, would remove their cast. Oh my gosh. Uh, the parents weren't around, so. Uh, uh, Jennifer, what do you think of this case? So there's linear increased signal intensity along the tibial plateau, kind of extending from the articular surface to the margin with surrounding edema. Um, compatible with a non-displaced fracture, and it does extend through the articular surface. Yeah, well, it's certainly impacted, uh, and you know, there's probably a little bit of displacement here. Uh, this was a ski injury. Uh, uh, Michael, this was part of our original uh, NEMR study that we did, a patient of Rick Rius, and uh, he came in with knee pain, and Rick called up and said, uh, you know, I, I don't need an MR scan, but uh, do you guys want to do a free MR scan to get some uh, uh, data uh, before I take him to surgery? So this is the lateral x-ray. That's right. Um, I'm not sure I see too much. Here's the... Okay, so now we can see that there's an impaction fracture that puts your lateral tibial plateau. Um, well, once you see the MRI, yeah, you get a little bit more of a, a view of um, the fracture on, on, on the x ray. Yeah, right. Um, you see the um, yeah, well, increased um, signal uh, below that area. To uh, yeah. so, increase increase signal. Like, this wasn't picked up prospectively on the X-ray. Um, he then did an arthroscope the patient. I mean, this guy was normal. He thought. Oh no! If you go to the left uh, image, John, the, the X-ray image. Yeah, the, the, there's an the there's system. an area area of sclerosis type um, signal below the right adjacent to that fibula, fibular head, right in there, that area. I think that, that's part of the fracture. Yeah. I don't think don't that's, you? That's a compressed trabecular bone right in there. Yeah. 
So the arthroscope, the patient, the cartilage was intact, and it was actually hard to realize that there was a break here and, and the, uh, artic in, the, in the bone underneath it uh, because the cartilage was, was intact. So uh, actually, he thinks that he would not have actually picked this up if he hadn't had the MR scan first. Uh, but, but this was a, a depressed fracture of the posterior tibia plateau, which he elevated. That's a, that's a surgical case. Um, so we see that kind of incomplete hypointense uh, linearity in the uh, medial tibial or in the um, yeah, medial tibial plateau with a uh, uh, surrounding edema. So it just looks like kind of a subchondral fracture, and there. This person, patient looks younger, so it's not going to be an insufficiency fracture. It's just going to be like a. Well, so it's it's a yeah, it's kind of an incomplete subchondral fracture here. It's low in signal because the trabecular bone are compressed and they're defacing. The that looks like a varus injury, doesn't it? Or wait a minute, on which side are we on? This is the lateral side, so it'd be more of a valgus type. All right, uh, Ashley, what do you think of this case? Well, I think we're looking here at the uh, medial femoral condyle. You can see a, a quite marked bone marrow edema, and you can see a uh, decreased signal there. It looks like a subchondral fracture. Um, yeah, and these are yeah. the and this is like John was saying, compressive type injuries pr uh, produce a lot more edema than distractive type injuries, and in, in, uh, generally. Uh, Jennifer, what do you think of this one? All right. So here we can see diffuse edema within the tibial plateau, and there is some linear decreased signal intensity paralleling the subchondral bone plate. So this looks like a subchondral insufficiency fracture. Yeah. So that this was on 42704, kind of an impaction subchondral fracture. Here we are. Uh, Okay, uh, four. So that's just a. Uh, I, I think that's too much. Uh, I think that's a injury, um, valgus injury. Um, okay. Yeah. With the compression. Right. I, I don't think this is an insufficiency fracture. Correct. I agree. Yeah. It, the, the, it's hard to say. It's all we know is that the amount of force on the bone was more than the bone. Then. So whether it's due primarily to weakened bone or to or to uh, increased pressures, yeah, it's hard to say just looking at the MR. Okay. And then uh, and this is what it looked like a year earlier. Okay. Uh, Michael, what do you think of this case? Okay, so um, I noticed on the right image there's a joint effusion kind of with the fluid fat level maybe. They just, if that's real, then I'd assume that there's a fracture somewhere. Okay, and so now I can see the kind of uh, depressed uh, tibial plateau fracture. That's what it looks like. Yeah. see a nice uh, fluid, fluid, fluid level here from the acute uh, hematoma. And then this is just a depressed comminuted uh, tibial plateau fracture here. So those are the type two. Type three changes are really where you just see uh, increased density of the bone, typically associated with loss of articular cartilage and other changes, uh, which uh, so we characterize this as more of a degenerative type lesion. And here you can see that it's really low in signal, very low in signal, not just gray, but uh, really black in signal intensity and the subchondral bone here. And it's, uh, it's again, very typical of uh, degenerative disease, loss of articular cartilage, and these are just sclerotic changes. Again, it just has this very characteristic chronic degenerative type uh, appearance uh, as far as the margins are concerned. 
and with very usually these have very little edema on the fluid sensitive images so uh, and then when we first started doing PD fat set images with fat suppression here is a our traditional uh, uh, proton density and T2 weighted sequences the bone looked pretty normal maybe there's a little concern here but that's hard to say but then when we started doing uh, fat suppressed images we could see in that area there's uh, obvious bone edema and uh, you can also see these characteristic incomplete fractures here of the uh, uh, fibra and then you can see the increased edema within the bone either with stir images or PD fat side images but you're all really familiar with that so nothing too much new here uh, but but it's still uh, it's important again as I've said many times over not just to have fat suppressed images uh, see who did the, who did the last one I think I've already shown I've already shown this particular case with the knee here it's obvious that you've got a, a distraction injury down here the injury of the fibula is less well visualized on the fat suppressed images but with the non fat suppressed you can see that what's really important is actually a displaced fracture of the fibular head which is <clears throat> less well visualized on the uh, on the fluid sensitive images because uh, what we have here is a distraction injury with very little edema around it, but we see that there's actually a displaced bone fracture there. So uh, we know that x ray cold bone injuries are common. Uh, the hemorrhage comes from trabecular fractures, and if it's not adjacent to the subchondral plate, these trabecular injuries have very good prognoses. Okay. Ashu, what do you think of this one? The patient had a recent hip replacement. Okay, so patient's recent hip replacement. You can see that there's uh, quite a bit of asymmetry with a lot of edema in the posterior soft tissues um, and involving the, uh, I think this is the, oh, and then there's a, there's a joint effusion. I think it might be involving some of the posterior muscle bellies as well, um, maybe the medial gastroc. This is probably the periosteum here. Okay. Uh, one second. Sorry, they're calling me. One sec. Okay, go ahead. And then, and then we can see a little dim here. Th this was just an overuse injury because uh, the patient started walking more after they got their hip replacement. Okay, and uh, here I just, uh, I think we've already talked about this before, but uh, when you get in the diaphysis, uh, you've got a thick cortex and uh, 80 to 85 percent of the weight of the body really is supported by the by the cortical bone in the diaphysis when you go down to the epiphysis what you find is that the cortical bone becomes very thin down here and what you do have is a shift of the weight from the cortical bone into the trabecular bone here as we said to allow even distribution of the force across the joint space with a large cross-sectional area which decreases the pressure across the articular cartilage so and uh, so the support trabecular bone is very important if you fracture the uh, bone up here the, the, a lot of the trabecular on either side can take over the, the place of it if you fracture the trabecular bone right near the articulating surface then you don't have the ability to distribute the weight through the intact trabecular bone and you can get impaction fractures so the location is all very important and for prognosis it's really the subchondral plate that's really the key the key thing here. So, uh, uh, Jennifer, what do you think of this case? Okay, so here again, we can see some linear decreased signal intensity, kind of paralleling the subchondral bone plate along the medial femoral condyle, and there's diffuse surrounding edema. So, this is acute osteochondral injury. Yes. Right. And this involves the immediate subchondral bone here. In a study that Vallette did, uh, who's a radiologist in uh, Canada, found that these were very high risk for, uh, well, that's what they did as a study where they did an acute arthroscopy and then arthroscopy six months later, and they found that these subchondral uh, injuries like this, you, the, even though the initial arthroscopy may be negative, the repeat arthroscopy had a very high likelihood greater than 50% of, uh, of uh, significant cartilage loss if these are subchondral lesions. So these are the ones that are at high risk 
where we believe they really should be taken off weight bearing to allow this bone to heal. Otherwise, you'll get impacted fractures and destruction of the articular cartilage. And he called these geographic lesions. Here's an example, not quite as bad as the last one. This again is the subchondral bone here, but this is another real, relatively high risk lesion uh, that you need to warn the orthopedic surgeon about. Uh, if you see that, this was in 6504. Uh, uh, here's a CT scan uh, a little bit after that, where you can see the sclerotic lesion that John was pointing out in that other case in here uh, in this particular patient. Uh, let's see. Wonderful. And I think uh, uh, I forgot if I sent it to you. There was some one of those rad source articles that I don't know how they got it from West Study, but they're saying if the fracture line in total measured 27 millimeters in length, that that was significant if it's above that for like progression to like chronic fracture. Um, so this we see a similar one. We see this kind of curvilinear low signal intensity in the subchondral bone, um, and there's impacted, but the overlying cartilage is probably still intact, but there's quite a bit of edema within that little injury and the surrounding bone, but there's no, it doesn't look like there's fluid within the fracture line itself, so just call it a subchondral fracture at this point. And, and it, there's always more force and more deformation at the time of injury. Um, then, then afterwards, after the injury, there is some reconstitution uh, of of the of the structure. Um, in other words, it's compression and then and then um, um, decompression. Recompression. Thanks, John. Um, so what you're looking at is a stable situation. Um, the, most of the damage that was done in terms of force and compression uh, is not there anymore. Uh, so you have to think of this as uh, future problems uh, more more prominent than what the X-ray shows or the MRI shows. Great. Okay. Well, why don't we stop here and we'll pick up on these uh, injuries? Uh, see on Thursday. Okay. I pull, I pulled a booboo. Uh, UCLA took over orthopedic hospital. Right. Yeah. And that's fifty million dollars. Yeah. Uh, I spent a lot of time at uh, orthopedic hospital. I don't, USC blew it. Yeah. Right. All right. Uh, they, they 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 were asking for too many different things, I guess. Yeah. Yes. Politics, politics, politics. Yeah, politics and money. Yes, yes. Uh, well, go, they, they both go together. Uh, yeah, right. Um, have a good um, day off, John. And okay. We'll, we'll see everybody on uh, Thursday. Thank you. Bye. Hey, Dr. Cruz? Yes. Do you mind going back to the presentation? I just wanted to see my example again. Thank you. Bye.